Okay, so I think it's time to start now. Um, I'll welcome to this um, lecture. Um, so it's a journey in the world of geometry and algebra. Um, so I'm going to um, um, continue what I was um, talking about last time um, related to algebraic geometry. And I think we all agree that every day we meet algebraic geometry. So for example, <laughs> when you go um, to some tennis, <laughs> play tennis, um, well, you can see a ceiling which has this amazing geometry here. So um, I think it's pentagonal geometry. So you probably you have some um, platonic solid hidden there. And you see um, the configuration of lines, configuration of um, points there too, a lot of symmetries, Coxter groups. So yes, we see algebraic geometry every day. Okay, so let's be sorry seriously now. Um, so we know all from linear algebra first year that for a given system of linear equations, like, like here, you see, which is defined over some ring or some field, there exists a set of solutions, right, in a given k algebra L. That's what we were saying last time. And if you decide that L, your space of solutions, will be the field of real numbers, then we start entering in classical Euclidean geometry with the classical Euclidean axioms. And so um, your set of solutions, this system of equations, corresponds, geometrically speaking, to something like a point. So here you have a point, or you could have a line, or a plane, or something hyperplane, depending on where you're working. So if you're in Rn, you can have hyperplanes and things like that. Um, so this uh, sounds very elementary, but there are some hidden um, problems here, right? So as I was saying last time, in the physical world, many seemingly basic things turn out to be created and construction constructed from even more basic things. So for example, molecules are made out of atoms, atoms are made of protons, neutrons, electrons. And you have exactly the same phenomena in mathematics. So last time I was talking about numbers. Today, while I was preparing this lecture, I stumbled across a very nice problem. <laughs> so, um, so you agree with me that you see points and lines everywhere all the time. So here, for example, I, I picked a picture from someone here in, in some social media, <laughs> and you have points and lines here. And you agree with me, certainly, that points and lines are some kind of building blocks in geometry and algebra. This is like something fundamental. And so my question, my problem today, is guided by this very simple problem. What is a point? So how can you define a point? It sounds really elementary, right? This is just the point is this, like it just wrote on the slide. It's just this. But what is this, right? What is the point? We don't know what's a point, in fact. And it's a very, turns out it's a very deep problem and very deep question. Um, and you have many different answers coming from very different backgrounds. And so today, so my mantra will be to define what is a point. And I'll be um, investigating all possible manners of defining a point, whether it is from some topological viewpoint or maybe some geometrical viewpoint or 
categorical framework or algebraic geometry framework, so on. So this is the guiding line today. What is a point? So as I said, you represent a point in this way. So you just draw something like this, like here. And you have many very different definitions of the notion of abstract point. So the topological here, the algebraic geometrical, which turns out to be very um, not trivial to define. Like this is, we're going to define today the notion of point from the algebraic geometry point of view. And it's going to take the whole lecture. And so you have the categorical framework to define the point, a set theoretical definition too, the ge geometrical point, the number theory definition of a point also, and so on. You have many other definitions. So this is the, um, the problem of today. <coughs> so, um, so I think the easiest way to start discussing the notion of point um, is to go back in history. So the notion of point is somehow subconsciously in our heads. We all know what is a point. But we don't really know what is the point, right? So it's hidden in our heads. And I'll go back in history with Euclid, who is the first person who gave actually axioms and tried to um, put the foundations in order to define a mathematical theory with proofs and, and the statements. So he introduced axioms. And in fact, so what is a point is a very interesting question because even at the time of Euclid, there was a problem. <laughs> so in Euclidean geometry, a point is defined only by some properties called axioms. So you need axioms. So it's, it proves you that the notion of point is so fundamental and so deep that you need some rules, some fixed rules from the start in order to define your point. So it's not so trivial, right? <laughs> so uh, I think we all agree on the comment that points do not have any length. So it's very hard to define a point because it doesn't have any length, no area, no volume, or any other dimensional attribute. There is, it's impossible to, to use something like like this to define it. And Euclid defined it himself as something that has no part, whatever that means. It just has no part. So the question is, what does that really mean to have no part? And here comes um, the, the devil, right? Because um, Euclid's postulations of points was, was in fact neither complete nor definitive. So the way he defined a point is not exactly, well, he's cheating. That's in short, he's cheating a bit. So he assumes facts about points that do not directly follow from his axioms. So for example, ordering of points on the line or the existence of specific points. So in fact, he, he needs to a bit to cheat, right? To define the notion of point because it does not really follow directly from the axiom. So this is the, the nuance. This is, um, yeah, this tells you a lot about the kind of problem we're investigating, right? And so, um, like, I found this title amusing. The common point of the notion of, of this point <laughs> is that although you have very different definitions, very different theories defining the notion of point, they all have something in common. And they all agree on the fact that a point is considered as zero dimensional. 
whatever the definition of dimension is. So you have, so this is exercise for you to check all possible def definitions of the dimension. And you will see that even though you have like house door dimension, like topological dimension, many other dimensions, they all agree on the fact that here, your point is zero dimensional. So there is something really, really deep there. So exercise for you, don't forget, give all the definitions of dimension. And so um, this funny question about defining an, such an elementary and trivial thing as, as a point um, leads to um, new perspectives, right? Because since it's um, so hard to define a point, and although it's really fundamental in geometry and topology, well, you can um, define new theories such as non-commutative geometry and pointless topology where you can live, you can do things without this notion of a point. So that's very interesting because this is like, the point is something we all think we know, but somehow you have new perspective where you can completely omit um, the definition of a point. And here you go to non-commutative geometry and pointless topology. And the very funny thing, so in this philosophy of trying to define the notion of a point is as follows. So a pointless or a point-free space is defined not as a set, but via some, some structure. So you'll input some algebraic structure or, or logical if you like to work in logic which looks like, which has the, the flavor of a well-known function space on the set. So it's an algebra of continuous functions or an algebra of sets, respectively. And so such structures generalize well-known spaces of functions in a way that the operation take a value at this point may not be defined. So here you see the entrance on the stage of we, some interesting algebraic structures appearing, right? Very abstract algebraic structure. So if you go now to physics, um, they have a totally different point of view on, on the notion of point. Um, and it's useful for them to think of a point as having non-zero mass, whatever that means, or charge. And this is especially common in classical electromagnetism, where electrons are idealized as points with non-zero charge. So this is yet again a totally different perspective on, on the notion of point. And for example, well, we have all seen, at least once in our lives, the Dirac function, Dirac delta function. Um, and this is informally a generalized function on the real number line that is zero everywhere. So we can draw something here, so zero everywhere. And suddenly, boom, this goes up and is again zero. And um, so except at zero, so this you had zero, with an integral of one over the entire real line. So let's clear this drawing. So um, this is yet again a new perspective, right? <clears throat> Which has nothing to do with um, the one we had previously. Yes, so this was um, the physics perspective, um, but now, so I'm still investigating other different possible definitions and um, we can go towards category categories here. So a categorical point of view. And here I would say that this looks like one of the, um, in some way, easiest ways of defining the notion of point, right? So let's see what is a point in this categorical flavor. 
<clears throat> so in case you don't need you don't know as a category it's not a problem because I'll um, recall the notion and so a category C consists of some data that satisfies certain properties so you have you need two things which are very important some things called objects so you have objects X Y Z and so on and you have some relation between them which are called the morphisms and this is f maps x to y and along with the morphisms you have some property of composition so if you go from the object x to y via this f morphism and from y to z using this g morphism then you have a composition operation which is absolutely possible and uh, and so um, you have G composed with F here mapping X to Z, right? So this is important. And you have two more properties. So you have something which exists, which is called the identity morphism. So you map X to himself, right? And you have associativity. So if you want to compose first H with G and then with F, this amounts to composing H with G and F. Right, so um, yeah, so you have associativity here, and so the category is defined here in this way. And like in the categorical point of view, um, we can interpret an abstract point as a category, which is made of an, one single object. So you just have one, one object here, and obviously the single morphism that is allowed is the identity morphism. So you have a category from formed from one object and the identity morphism and this is this is a point in their in their setting so you have yet again a new definition of point so we had something with um like physics <laughs> delta Dirac um function for the physicists and you had here and now you have like a um, category with which is formed with one object and this identity morphism here so it's um very, very different. Very different. And from the set theoretical um, point of view, which is quite close to this categorical framework, um, a point is a singleton set with just one unique element. And this, yeah, this is absolutely natural, right? And also another possible definition in pure set theory is that the point is the set which is done made of this empty set. So, um, yeah, but this is like algebraic, right? It's not really geometric. It's not what we imagine with this kind of thing, which we draw. Right? So this is said theoretical um, approach. And uh, finally, uh, like topological viewpoint on points. So if you have a um, topological space, um, topologically a point in this topological space can be thought of a continuous function from a singleton space to x now if you don't remember which is a, what is a topological space i have made here um, a definition um, so to define a topological space you just need two things like a set and a collection of subsets which i call tau here and now that you have these two objects, you have three properties. So first, you need that the empty set and X belong to tau, to the collection of subsets. And now you have two more properties concerning union and intersection. So for the union, any arbitrary union of members of these subsets belong to tau. For the intersection, you have a restriction. You need a finite intersection. So uh, the intersection of a finite number of members of tau belongs to tau again. So here you have a topology. Okay. And so this point, um, you have a continuous function from the singleton space to x. So this is... Um, This is from like, so we have seen topological point of view, categor categorical framework, 
physics framework, um, set theoretical, etc., etc., intuitive by Euclid. But now, from the algebraic geometry point of view, things are not so trivial, in fact. And as we will see from the algebraic geometry point of view, the definition of a geometric point is far from being straightforward. And we we need a lot of material and a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, notions, in fact, to um, to define this algebraic geometry um, notion of point. And this is what we're going to do now. Um, so. As we have been saying last time, we have a system of um, of equations. So we have maybe some polynomial equations here, finite number of polynomials here, and a given set of variables, x, y, z, whatever. Um, and this is already a lot of information because, well, you have a lot of things happening. So first you have this ring k, this ring k where um, you take your coefficients. So here I have some integers, so ring. Um, then you have something else. Well, depending on um, what you want in your solutions, you have to define maybe some k algebra, so solutions in some k algebra called L. And, um, well, if you have a field, you can have field extensions, maybe. So it's already becoming complicated. And this is very algebraic. So maybe on if you're working in R or in complex numbers, um, you can define a surface and topological space there, um, a hypersurface, maybe. And going back to algebra, you have a coordinate ring. Right, and some ideal, which is generating your this system of equations. So we, we have a lot of things going on here, right? We have a lot of things here. Um, and so um, yeah, I'll just recall what we have been saying, and my aim will be to establish a dictionary between some very formal um, algebraic geometry and some things um, which we all like, <laughs> like this. <laughs> so, um, so we need some finite set of indices, i and j. Um, and we need also some unknowns, so t, we have t, uh, are the indeterminates, and you need also a set of polynomials, a finite set of polynomials here, which um, are with coefficients in k, your ring. So you have the following. You have a system of equations for some given unknowns t, which is given by a triple. This triple is formed from a ring or a field, depending on what you're doing, of coefficients for the coefficients. Um, you have the unknowns t and the function f, and you you express them so you express this um, system of equations as f i of t equals to zero for i in this big set well in this set of indices capital I. And so now why the ground ring of of constants enters the definition is really clear because the coefficients of fi belong to this fixed ring k. And so you say that your system is, is defined over k. But that doesn't have any consequence on, on your solution, space of solutions, right? And so this is the question about, do we have any solutions here? Maybe it depends on where you're working, which ring or field you're considering. And this is the answer here. To consider solutions of your system of equations belonging to a ring or a field L, we should be able to substitute the elements of L into your, uh, your polynomial fi with coefficients in k. 
and we should be able to multiply the elements from L by the elements from K and add the results. And that's why L must be a K-algebra. And I really like this um, perspective because um, it's not always, um, people don't always say things that way. And the K-algebra version is, is quite interesting in some sense, yeah. So here we're, you can maybe feel that we're heading towards a dictionary um, between very algebraic language, the language of schemes, towards something which we all like and all enjoy computing. Okay, so in case um, you need a reminder about K algebras, so let K be a ring. And the set L is a K algebra. If L is endowed with the structures of a ring and a K module, interrelated by a certain number of properties. We have three properties. So obviously you need a multiplication. So you define your multiplication such that if you take an element in K and element in L, you will land in L. So this is right and left distributive with respect to the addition. That's the first condition. Um, second condition is called associativity. So if you take an element, any element in fact in, in your ring K, and you multiply it by some product of elements in L, so L1 and L2, well this amounts to multiplying any element in K with some element of L1, of L, so L1 times an element of L again, so L2. This, this is associativity. Um, okay, so this is like two important properties and then you have the unit. So this is algebra, you need multiplication, associativity and unit as always. And um, if you define one L to denote the unity of L, well, to define a K-algebra structure on L, you need a ring homomorphism. So you, you have an embedding of K into capital L, which sends um, K times the unit over K into its image times the unit of L. And um, now, in case you need a reminder on homom ring homomorphism, so um, here you have your favorite rings, R and S, with um, respectively their operations, multiplication, addition, and uh, multiplication, addition here. And, um, well, homomorphism means exactly that phi of some addition in R is the addition in the S, phi of R plus R, R uh, here, R prime, uh, and uh, phi of multiplication is the multiplication of the images here. So this is a homomorphism of rings. Okay, um, so this is the, your K algebra. And so for your um, solution of your favorite system, given by these beautiful equations, <laughs> uh, with values in some given K algebra L, is a set of elements of L such that they verify this condition. And um, we will denote the set of solutions by this, um, this symbol here. So it's a Gothic uh, X. And um, here comes our favorite um, problem notion here. Each solution is called an L point of the system of equations. So here we're back to the problem of defining what is a point. And um, okay, so this is, um, we're back to the beginning. <laughs> um, anyway, here I am in the perspective of um, creating a dictionary and a bridge between two languages. So um, let's continue. And then we will come back to the notion of point. So we denote this here. Um, by This is a coordinate rank of some given variety, right? So you have F which is your um, set of, like, it's given by some set of polynomials, 
And this, in fact, defines an ideal. So you're quotienting this ring of polynomials modulo some, some ideal f. And now um, there is a nice, very nice correspondence, which is one-to-one. -one. So the set of solutions of your system of equation is in one-to-one -one correspondence with this k-algebra, so k-algebra homomorphism um, going, going to this um, k-algebra L. So you have here hom is a set of k-algebra homomorphisms. And so you, you see already that we're getting into some uh, abstract um, algebraic language here. And finally, we can define our um, dictionary. So we have two languages. <coughs> so in red, we have a system of um, equations, which is used in very concrete calculation. And so you have a system X of equations verifying f i of t equals to zero. You have some coefficients in some given ring, and you have the solutions in some k algebra called L. And now, um, if you want to go to the little scheme language and, and things like that, you have to establish here um, um, a dictionary as follows. So you have rings and their morphism. So when you have this system of equation, you define a coordinate ring, where f now is an ideal. The coefficients of fi of t um, correspond, in fact, to some ring of polyn well, r in a ring, and you have a ring of polynomials k of t with coefficients in, in k. And now the solutions correspond to some algebra homomorphism and each solution is an L point here so this is the dictionary and this is um going towards language of schemes okay so like to summarize this um, we have a system of equations over a ring R for some unknown and you have um, its analog in some different language as a k-algebra with a system of generators. Reciprocally, you have a solution of the system in some k-algebra L, and the analog is a k-algebra homomorphism going from kx into L. Okay, and so this is um, the nice dictionary we have established um, for this system of equation. But so, as I told you previously, um, the notion of B point or L point is quite mysterious. It's not clear what's happening at all. Um, we don't know what it is, in fact, right? So, um, I'm gonna present a definition and I'm going to comment, right? So, we have K, our main ring. We have X a system of equations, some unknowns, T1, T2, Tn. And for any K algebra L, we, we realize the set here of X of L as a graph in Ln, the coordinate space of our L. And the points of this graph are solutions of the system F I of T. So here comes this very mysterious and strange definition. Um, so here it's like uh, the bracket missing here. So the points of a k-algebra A with values in a k-algebra B, or in short, B points of A, are the k-homomorphisms from A to B. And any B point of A is called geometric if B is a field. So um, this doesn't sound clear. <laughs> Not at all, because um, we don't know if we have some field extensions, we don't know what is exactly the notion of point here, what is the axiom, what is allowed, what is not allowed. So I'm not satisfied with this definition. And so this motivates the next part of this lecture. And so the next part of the lecture goes as follows. So here we have um, a plan, which is very, <laughs> very circular, um, as you can see here. So 
the very basic thing is first to define the field on which you're working, right? You, you take, you pick your favorite field, K. And now you have a system of equations. So we are going to talk in the terms of coordinate ring. So we have a coordinate ring here, right? And um, maybe you want to understand, so this is already very algebraic, and you want to understand maybe the geometry of this or the topology, what is happening, right? So if you're in R or in C or what is happening? This is a great, great question. Huh? So you have maybe some topological space, some um, topological invariants, um, some geometric uh, properties, which are invisible under the eyes of, through the eyes of um, some algebraic equation. And um, <clears throat> you have maybe some extension of fields. So maybe if you have no solution in of your system of equation in, in a given um, field K, maybe you have to think about extending your field, right? And taking something bigger. Maybe in this bigger um, set, you'll find a solution. Yes, and all this is great. And this leads to number five, which is maybe Galois theory or Maybe Galois, maybe points in K and L, maybe rational points, um, finite fields, I don't know. So this is um, the plan, the plan to follow. Okay, so my aim now is going to be to define the notion of algebraic closure, which is in fact, in fact crucial. Um, when you want to have um, your set of solutions for a given set of equations. So it's really crucial. Um, so we have been um, mentioning and discussing the notion of um, algebraic extension um, last time. And so we're now going a bit deeper in the theory. Um, so we have, so now K is not anymore a ring, but it's just a field, right? So we need an extension maybe of fields. Right, so K, um, which will be extended into L, which is uh, contained in capital K here. Um, and now, now I need a definition. And so um, here, uh, let's take our time because it's not, it's not simple. It's not gonna be um, straightforward always. <clears throat> so the definition is as follows. So consider small k and capital K, um, where small k is contained in capital K. And you say that you have a simple extension if capital K is this. So what is this? So k with this bracket alpha is the smallest subfield of capital K, which contains small k and alpha. So you have everything that's happening here in the small k. And you, you need something bigger, right? Because your set of solution does not fit into your small k. So you need to, to grow. And to grow, you need this capital K. And so the notion of, of growing here um, is quite complicated. So you need um, something simple to start with. So a simple extension. So you have k alpha is the smallest subfield of this capital K containing something new, this alpha, right? Alpha did not live in K, in small k. So this is, um, this is quite important here. This is quite important. And um, I'm going to present something that I call the favorite lemma, because in fact, you will notice um, throughout this lecture that we will basically use all the time this lemma. Whenever you're proving some statement, you will need this lemma. So this is now the favorite lemma. So now we need to register in our heads that this is the favorite lemma. So consider a simple extension, right? Simple extension was just defined above. So if K, capital K is a simple extension, so equal to K of alpha with alpha algebraic over K. Then it so happens that capital K is 
equivalent to. This quotient of polynomials, polynomial ring with coefficient in small k, modulo, some ideal, which is given by f, and f is the minimal polynomial of alpha. The class of x by this um, isomorphism corresponds to alpha. So now um, this is not easy and we need to think. Um, so in case we have forgotten what it means to be algebraic, here is a reminder. So if you have an extension, field extension, capital K over small k, and alpha belongs to capital K, we say it's algebraic over small k if there exists a non-zero polynomial f with coefficients in small k such that f of alpha is zero. So it's algebraic if you find a polynomial which is not trivial and such that alpha is a root, in short. So you need a, and this is called al uh, algebraic. And minimal, it just means that um, it's of the smallest degree, such that alpha is a root, and there is a, a statement that says that it is unique. It is unique. Okay. And so this is the favorite lemma. So you want to show that, considering you have a simple extension, then your, your k is nothing but this quotient of this ring of polynomials by some given minimal polynomial. This is what you want to prove. So this is called your favorite lemma. And we're going to discuss this statement. So it requires a lot of um, algebra, uh, rings and ideals and things like that. Okay, so um, the first step is to build, oh, construct a map. You're going to construct a map from this polynomial, uh, this ring of polynomials with coefficients in small k to the field capital K. So capital K, we just know that capital K is k of alpha. That's what we know by hypothesis. And this map is interesting because it gives the value of a polynomial, a polynomial belonging here, at alpha. And moreover, you can say one thing, that this map is a ring homomorphism. Okay, so now let's um, discuss it uh, with an example, well, kind of example. So take your favorite polynomial G, which lives in this polynomial ring, and now we use the map, Psi. Psi of G lives in capital K, but by definition, capital K is just small k of alpha. But what, what does that mean? So it just means that psi of g is equal to something which looks like g of alpha. Okay, so once we have established this, we can go further. So now we need to, so the classical tools is always to look at the kernel, prove that it's surjective, injective, and so, so on. So here we are going to look at the kernel. So the kernel of psi is not zero, it's not empty. Why? Well, it's not empty because alpha is algebraic. So in particular, we said that if alpha is algebraic, there is a polynomial such as f of alpha is zero. 
So you're looking at all the elements which are zero here to have your kernel. So it's not empty because alpha is algebraic. So you can define some p equals to kernel of psi as a non-zero prime ideal. And now uh, you need some tools from algebra, so from your studies. So now since um, k of x, this uh, polynomial ring, is a principal domain, um, so p, it becomes a maximal ideal. So here, this quotient of your, your polynomial ring mod p, this prime ideal, is a field. And so here, if you if it's not straightforward for you, you should um, check um, your lecture from algebra. So we have established that this is a field. But that's just the first step, right? We need a second step. So now we're drawing a beautiful diagram, commutative diagram. Um, so let us consider this um, ring of polynomials in K. This is our Psi that we have just discussed right now. And we go into capital K, this um, field. On the other hand, we have also um, made a quotient. Uh, so we have a second field here, k of x mod p. And this is pi. This will be pi because it's a kind of projection. And this is phi. And we'll be interested in understanding what is phi here. So um, let us consider that. <clears throat> so we all agree that we have some homomorphism. Phi is a homomorphism from this new field, which is kx mod p, into capital K. And now we want to know something. We want to know if it's injective. So is it injective? Yes. Yes, 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 because P is this kernel of Psi here. And it is also surjective since the image of Pi of X by Phi is equals to this. So Psi of X, where is Psi of X here? Psi of X is equal to alpha and the image of phi contains psi of k, which is k. And so we generate capital K, which is k of alpha here. Therefore, we have one conclusion. The conclusion is that capital K is k of x mod f, where f is the generator of the principal ideal. So in case you need a reminder on principal ideals, it's an ideal in the ring R generated by a single element A of R through multiplication by every element of R. So we have proven this, um, this building block here, so the favorite lemma. And we'll all the time keep um, coming back to this lemma. So we have proven that if k is small k of alpha with alpha algebraic, then capital K is nothing but this, this um, quotient of your ring of polynomials mod this ideal generated by f. So that's the favorite lemma. Great. Um, so, uh, yes, it was not easy, probably, this proof, but it's very, um, very good to know it and um, very useful. Um, and it gives you also good training. And so um, this uh, favorite lemma uh, kind of constructs um, 
well, it's like really this building block that you will be using uh, across other proofs. And in particular, I'm going to discuss now two very important lemmas, two very important lemmas, um, which are um, about finite extensions and another one, which is its converse. So you will have the converse lemma. Okay, so <clears throat> suppose that we have a simple extension, capital K over small k. So if we suppose that capital K is small k of alpha, where alpha is algebraic over small k, then capital K over small k is a finite extension. So I find this um, really very important to know. This is very important that this is a finite extension and the degree, the degree is equal to the degree of the minimal polynomial of alpha. So um, like always in algebra, it's very hard to have like um, uh, good pictures because there's nothing to draw. But um, we will just assume that small k, like the field is just represented by some bubble and capital K is represented by another bubble. And so since we have field extension, we are just going to draw it that way. And here, this bridge between small k and k is that you have something finite, finite dimensional. OK. So shall we prove that? Um, so we need, uh, as I said, <laughs> the favorite lemma. So we want to prove that if this is true, then you have a finite extension. So as we showed that if this is true, if capital K is K of alpha, then, then you can write it capital K as this, this um, quotient of K of X mod L. So let's use that. So by the previous favorite lemma, we know that capital K can be written differently and is equivalent to K of X, small k of X, mod F, where F is a given minimal polynomial of alpha. But now, here comes the crucial argument. It follows that capital K is generated as a vector space over small k by the classes of powers of x. And by the lemma, so here is, we have a footnote. You have the classes 1, alpha, etc., alpha power d minus 1. And you stop here because d is the degree of f. So you have a vector space here, k vector space, which is generated by this. So it's indeed um, finitely generated, right? And um, so modulo f, one can express the class alpha power d and by induction, all greater powers of alpha in terms of these generators, one, alpha, and so on, so alpha power d minus one. And so we can see without any problem that these classes are linearly independent over k. So in fact, all this algebraic extension problem resumes just to some um, linear algebra, right? You just need linear algebra to understand that. Linear algebra of first year. So. Okay, so these classes are linearly independent over small k. Otherwise, there would be a non-trivial linear combination of the, these over k, which would vanish, and so, and so f, 
would not be the minimal polynomial of all four. So, it's a very, very pretty argument here to use. And so, um, the best way I could find to, <laughs> to draw this um, uh, algebraic um, extension problem um, is that I, well, we can draw this vector space, right? This is the vector space of, of um, dimension d, so finite dimension vector space, and this is small k. So this um, lemma um, is very, very, very pretty. Yes. So this was um, what I wanted to say about this lemma. And so, um, as I said previously, we have this converse version. So, and the converse version say, states that if f is a given polynomial, which is irreducible, of some given degree d, there exists an extension, capital K over small k, of degree d, in which f has a root alpha. And you can write k, capital K, as small k of alpha. So this is really the converse, right? Now you start, you start with some given polynomial f, which has some properties, so you need irreducibility, you have some degree greater than zero, and you have, so, and your second data is that you have an extension of degree d. Well, well no, this is what you want to prove. There is an extension of degree d in which f has a root of alpha. And you want to write it that way. So this is what we are going to prove now. So, um, so to prove this, you always use the same. You use this favorite lemma and probably some algebra some algebra um, tools. Um, so let's start. So um, we're going to define capital K as K of X mod ideal F. And now it's again the same game as previously. Since K of X is a principal ring, so a ring where you have a footnote, and since your polynomial of degree d is irreducible, well, you know that your ideal f is maximal. Okay? And so, and so you know that capital K is a field and the composed homomorphism from small k into capital K is injective. So you use all the time the same things, in fact. And now here comes the, the how to say, funny part, and like funny, <laughs> not really funny, but this is um, quite interesting to do. This means that you're dealing with an extension capital K over small k such that alpha verifies the following. So we have defined um, pi going from this ring of polynomials in small k into capital K. Great. And um, now you pick your polynomial, irreducible, um, of degree d, and f of alpha is now f of pi of x, right? But, um, so now you, you expand your polynomial, this is the definition of a polynomial, pi of x power d, coefficient pi of x power d minus 1, etc., etc., plus coefficient ad. And now, I hope you did not forget that we have, in fact, a homomorphism here. Homomorphism. And so, by definition and property of a homomorphism, <clears throat> this here all is equal to pi of the polynomial f. And pi of f, pi of f is zero by definition. Right? Because k is this. So now pi of f is equal to zero. 
So this we have proven. We have now proven, what have we proven? That if f is a polynomial, degree d, reducible, there is an extension, capital K over K, which is a degree d, in which f has a root alpha, and capital K is K of alpha. So we have, in fact, um, now in hand three very important statements that um, will allow you to do almost everything when considering Galois problems, Galois um, extension of fields and so on. So, um, yeah, it was really cr crucial to see this and um, one should always keep these proofs in mind. Okay, so we have been working very hard trying to prove these statements. Um, and we go back now to the question of what is a point. <laughs> and I cannot still answer this question from the algebraic geometry point of view because we need something which is called algebraic closure. Okay, so let's give this definition. We are finally able to state a proper definition of algebraic closure. So, of course, there exist many different ways of um, um, looking at this um, topic, but um, so here I chose one of them here. So, um, a field K is algebraically closed if it verifies some conditions. So, first, it is algebraically closed if it has no proper algebraic extension. First. Second, every reducible polynomial of k x has degree 1. Three, every non constant polynomial of k x factors completely. And linear factors. And last, fourth, every non constant polynomial of Kx has at least one root in K. So this gives you maybe an idea of what it means to be algebraically closed. And exercise for you. Prove using the previous three lemmas the equivalence between these conditions. So this is exercise for you. Using all the three lemmas we have been discussing, you can show that there is an equivalence between these four points. Okay. So, so we can move to a definition, which, um, which is very nice. So suppose you have a field K, small k, contained in a field capital K. So we say that capital K is an algebraic closure of small k. If we have two things happening. So the first, this extension of fields, capital K over small k, is an algebraic one. So check the first lecture for the definition of algebraic extension, um, in case you don't remember. And two, capital K is algebraically closed, right? It verifies these four properties. So in particular, you have no proper algebraic um, extension. So there are very like interesting examples below. So take your field of rational numbers. And this field in, in the complex numbers does not fulfill the condition. Why? 
Why? Because C, complex numbers, contains some transcendental elements. So um, this is quite funny, right? So you have Q and you, you want to extend it so you can take Q of square, like cubic square root of two and, and so on and etc. until you get to this Q bar, this algebraic closure of Q and this is contained in, in C. So this is this is a funny thing happening here that Q contained in C does not fulfill the condition. But if you take, of course, Q bar, then you satisfy both conditions here. So um, it's very subtle and very delicate, right? So when we're dealing with this kind of um, object here around. Okay, so now I'm going to state like two more very important results related, of course, to this um, algebraic closureness and its finite extensions. And here goes a lemma, which I'll just I will just not prove this lemma. You can prove it. At home. So suppose that you have capital K and K bar, which are two algebraic closures of K, such that capital K is contained in K bar. If this is true, then capital K is equal to K bar. I don't think I have, no, I did not make a picture. But try to do this um, picture with these diagrams, right? And now the theorem, which is strongly, tightly related to this lemma, is that any field K has an algebraic closure key bar, which is unique up to K isomorphism. So this is like very important. I mean, this is crucial here. And tightly related to this. Um, so, um, yeah, so can someone guess how to prove this statement? No? No. Okay, so I'm giving you a hint. And the hint is that you need to use the Zorn lemma and this lemma here. Do you remember what's the Zorn lemma? Well, it's a very nice lemma concerning posts. Right? And so it says that in a partially ordered set, M, Suppose that every linearly ordered subset N in M contains a maximal element. Then M contains a maximal element. So to give a picture, um, I would imagine Russian dolls. So you have these Russian dolls, one containing the other. And well, this is all nested, so obviously it's going to work. <laughs> But this Russian doll system tells you that, well, you always have one maximal element. That means one maximal Russian dolls containing all the others. Right. So the idea of the proof is as follows. So we need to prove the existence, use Zorn's lemma, and prove uniqueness. Okay, let's do that. So the family Z 
of all algebraic extensions of k is ordered, right? So we were saying that we had some small k field, which is contained in something bigger, contained in something bigger, so on. The Russian doll system, right? Bigger, bigger, bigger. So you have a post set, you have some order notion. So it's not empty because it contains k as an element, this post set. And now you have chains. Every chain of algebraic extension of k, so every subset totally ordered by inclusion, has an upper bound. So if you take like a sub uh, set of Russian dolls, you have an upper bound, so a bigger Russian doll contains them. And you have the union of all elements of the chain. And now you can use Zorn's lemma. So it tells you that there exists, in fact, a maximal element. So a Russian doll which is bigger than all the others, containing the others, smaller ones, which is therefore an algebraic extension of K. And it is also algebraically closed. Well, yes, it's algebraically closed. Otherwise, it would contradict its maximality. Right? Remember? Here? Uh -huh. You remember. Great. Okay, so there's a small nuance, a small problem here, which I will let you solve alone. <laughs> And which concerns um, the following. The family Z under question is not a set. So you have a lot of paradoxes of set theory and so on here. So I'll just let you investigate this. But to get around this difficulty, we observe that the algebraic closure of K must be countable if K is a finite field and also must have the same cardinality as k if k is infinite. So one counts for each degree the set of all polynomials. So this is little parentheses for you um, just to think about. So we have proven existence, right? And now we want uniqueness, right? We don't want two um, algebraic closures running around, right? Um, so we proceed the same way, starting with Zorn's lemma, and here comes our favorite lemma again. And then you have to do some ordering of the k embeddings, right? So I am aware I did not define the word k embedding, so here is a footnote. So if you have two field extensions of k, so capital K and L, a k embedding is any field homomorphism sigma from k to l, which is necessarily injective, and such that sigma restricted to small k is the identity, right? So over small k is identity, and here you have capital K to l, so field homomorphism. And here you will choose, um, so here we have capital K going into, well, l is k bar, obviously here. So it's, if I, it's enough to um, notice that sigma of k is algebraically closed. And so by the lemma, which we have just seen above here, here, so by this lemma, um, so by this lemma, we have, um, we have equality. Sigma of capital K is k bar. So we have proven everything that was necessary here, right? We have, we have any field K has an algebraic closure K bar, which is unique up to K isomorphism. So the K isomorphism, well, this comes from the K embeddings I have just um, roughly mentioned. But so this gives you an um, idea, an idea of, um, of what has been going on. Okay. So this is um, like the very important and crucial information um, to know about um, when you're solving um, some system of equations. Very important here. 
Um, and so now uh, we can discuss uh, like examples, something more concrete. <clears throat> So, um, like, just a little definition before we go there. We call a fine space of dimension a uh, n over some field k this topological space whose structure depends on k and which is described as um, its underlying set um, as as follow here, as follows here. Um, so it's defined in k bar the x i is here. We have this n tuple. Um, and so, um, yeah, so for people working algebraic geometry, you have something very important happening. The closed subsets of this affine space are the algebraic subsets, which are of this form. So we go back now to the first slide of, of the talk where we had a set of polynomials here, fi, and here you have points living in, in this affine space over k of dimension n. So we have polynomials with coefficients in k. And, well, this topology is called the Risky topology. The Risky topology is slightly different um, from what we have um, talked about, right? Okay, so as I promised, examples, let's be concrete. <laughs> So here, k is the field of rational numbers, and we suppose that we live in a two-dimensional space here, n equals to 2. So we may consider um, our algebraic um, set as uh, this here, v of f, as um, this equation, given by this equation. Well, the solution of this equation. And these are the points of the circle that have coordinates not only in, in Q. So this was what I was talking about last time. We had Pythagorean triangles, but also in Q bar. Yep. So we had all these Pythagorean triangles and also maybe solutions in Q bar. Uh, but I have another like example or not example. So if you change a bit this and you put minus three, well, what happens? The set of rational points on the circle of radius square root of 3 is just empty because 3 is not the sum of squares of two rational numbers. However, you have still points with coordinates in Q bar, right? So it's not completely empty. You have points in Q bar. On the other, like in a different tone, like, no, it's still the continuation of this. If you put zero um, here, so you just put zero, there's only one real point, the point zero, right? But you have, in fact, two lines if you switch to complex, um, to complex space, which are given by this equation. Um, so, we just have like 10 more minutes. Um, so I'll tell you the next part next time, um, but I'll show you a bit of examples until the end, right? Um, so for example, um, if you consider this cubic curve, so this is like uh, very interesting for elliptic curves, you have genus one, this is very famous and so on. Um, this is, in fact, uh, you, you see you have like two connected components if you're considering in, uh, you're working in the real framework. But this does not mean that you have uh, like two connected components in the complex space, right? So you have a lot of subtleties here going on. Um, and so, like here, you have another example. Um, this is level. This gives. Um, this shows level curves of this kind of um, equation of surface in a fine space. So, as you can see, the surface is in fact connected. But if you just take the level curves, you'll have something which is not connected. Yeah. 
Um, and so we have not yet defined the notion of um, geometric point from the algebraic geometry um, perspective. So this will be the next time. But um, as a how to say teaser for next time, I can assure you that for geometric points in algebraic geometry, you need some schemes. So you need a scheme, and you have some, of course, algebraic closure and some um, spectrum of a given field, and that way um, will kind of guarantee you the notion of geometric points um, in uh, algebraic geometry. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop here for today. Um, where is the stop sharing? Yeah, and if you have some um, questions, uh, please do not hesitate. Anyway, thanks a lot for attending. Um, it's a pleasure to give this lecture. And um, if there are no questions, well, then I, I will... May, may I ask one question? Yeah, yeah please go. Okay. Um, so at the very beginning, you said that in the non-commutative setting, you have to live in a world without points. Yeah. And, but um, your definition of points, for of geometric points for, for a K-algebra, this one should work out if this algebra is non-commutative as well, I wouldn't it? Wait. So I don't. Um, don't, don't, don't really this. Um, so at the beginning, I said something about non-commutative geometry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you gave it as an example for geometric settings, a setting where you work without points. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, when you when you defined. Uh, but, but you gave a definition for geometric points of a K-algebra, which essentially just consisted of map of field, um, a map of the K-algebra to a field, making some diagram commutative. Mm -hmm. And but this one should work out in the non-commutative setting as well, wouldn't it? So. Oh yeah, 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 yes, yes, definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, is. Does it just not carry enough information, or is it just not as interesting in the non-commutative setting? Or why do you say that sometimes you have to let go of this notion? Yeah, because so you see points. So the notion of point is very, as we have seen, very hard to define. Um, to define, although it's like quite intuitive in some sense. But um, like from the topological, I think from the topological point of view, everybody just draws like something, some dot, and this is called a point. And I think uh, when they're discussing about the fact that they do not need the notion of point in their axioms from this non-commutative geometry, I think um, they just had in mind that they don't want this kind of tick dot. Okay. <laughs> I think okay. it was in that sense, yeah. But is, is there still an underlying topological space or is there not anymore? Where? In the, in, in the non-commutative setting. So I know that... Uh, I mean, in the commutative setting, you have the spectrum of a ring, so. Yeah, exactly. Um, frankly speaking, I'm not a non-commutative geometry person, okay, okay. so <laughs> I cannot give you a lot of details about this. But um, yeah, they have some very specific axioms. I, I would recommend like to read um, this here. So you have Alan Cohn, who worked a lot on this, and. Um, there are papers with um, Marcoli on F1 geometry. It's probably a very interesting setting um, to see what's happening there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. a fancy field. <laughs> and it's like recent work. I mean, it's like from last year. So definitely interesting. Any more um, questions? If not, um, I'll just end this meeting and thanks for attending. So see you maybe next week. Bye.